So if you would open your Bible, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. As you're doing that, I'll say a little something about my family. Um, my entire family was planning on coming with me, my wife and five kids. This morning, right when our alarm went off, our one-year-old got sick. And so that kind of that changed plans in an instant. Uh, my wife is home with our youngest three, and my oldest two came with me. So my daughter, Annie, who is 14, sitting in the front row, and my son, Zachary, uh, came with me this morning. I love being able to have some of the kids come with me. It's not as fun making that hour trip by yourself. So uh, thank you so much for the warm welcome today, and my, and children, my children enjoyed Sunday school as well. For the reading of God's word, let's stand in honor of the word of the king. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. I'll read through to the end of the chapter, and then we'll have a word of prayer. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek for wisdom. But we, we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may abolish the things that are so that no flesh may boast before God. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You may be seated as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning, and I pray that it speaks to us boldly, convicting our hearts, renewing our minds, that we may come to see your greatness and your goodness in the message of the cross. It is foolishness to the worldly, to those who are without God, to those who are perishing. To us who have heard the word and have come to believe it, it is the power of God. And so may we understand it is is not by man's craftiness that we come to know God, not by man's wisdom, not uh, not by philosophy or good argument. It is by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit and the word of Christ that was spoken to us that we have come to believe. And so may your name be praised. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I shared this story with my Sunday school class last week, so I thought I would open with this this week as well. The church that I pastored in Kansas 
for 10 years. In 2015, we kind of went through our own Calvinism versus Arminianism sort of a uh, sort of a period. Now, we didn't really call it that. It's kind of looked like that in hindsight. There were a lot of different issues going on, but it basically came down to an argument over whether God had foreordained those who were going to be saved or whether it was by man's free will. The only people who were really using the term Calvinist were the people who hated the doctrine of God's sovereign election. They were were going, oh, those Calvinists over there. So it even uh, got into like a war of different Bible translations. You had those who were of the more Reformed persuasion coming in with the ESV study Bible. The Reformed study Bible, the Reformation study Bible had just come out at that time, or the MacArthur study Bible. And then uh, the the semi-Pelagians wanted to have their own study Bible. So they all latched on to the Ryrie Study Bible for some reason. And I was like, he was more on MacArthur's side than you are. So, and I don't know what the rationale there was exactly. But anyway, there was one young man in our church. For the sake of the story, I'm going to say his name was Stephen. And he was a very new believer. And there was a man that had invited him to our church. He was a deacon, and he was on the free will side of the argument. And Stephen really admired this deacon, attended his Sunday school class, and listened to him pour out all of these arguments. Things where he disagreed with the Calvinists or disagreed with the doctrine of election. And he listened to both sides, but he just wasn't fully persuaded by either one. And so he came up to me after church one time and he said, I've, I've talked with this deacon and I've had these conversations with him and I would sure like to talk with you and get your understanding and get your perspective on, uh, on soteriology and a study of salvation and things like that. And, and I said, okay, we'd love to sit down and chat with you. You want to get together for lunch sometime? And he said, sure. I had my favorite lunch spot. It was always a good excuse for me to eat lunch there when we can eat a good burrito and talk theology. So we met together, I I believe it was on a Tuesday, and he came armed with all of these arguments against Calvinism. He had a notebook full of them. And he said, I I just jotted down these thoughts and was wondering if I could run these things by you. And I said, okay. And so for about the next 20 or 25 minutes, he went through that notebook arguing all five points of TULIP. You know, went through total depravity and went through unconditional uh, uh, election and all these kinds of things, irresistible grace, everything, went through all of it and, and gave his arguments. And honestly, I didn't argue back. I just sat there and let him talk. And when he got to the end of that, I said, well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've thought long and hard about this, even to jot those thoughts down. And I appreciate you sharing those things with me. And I said to him, I'm really not interested, though, in sitting here and providing a counter argument. I don't really want to go through TULIP. I mean, there's some things about that we can talk about, and I can correct where, you know, I think you were mistaken. But if you don't mind, I'd just like to go to the Scriptures. And he said, sure, we can do that. And I said, okay, you have your Bible there. Open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's just start reading there. And we weren't even in 1 Corinthians at the time. I think I was teaching out of 2 Timothy and this particular chapter that was going on in our church about to start a study in Romans. And so the Lord had just laid on my heart that morning that maybe to minister to this young man, I could take him to 1 Corinthians so that he would see all those different places where Paul said, God has chosen, God has chosen, and it's by his doing that you are in Christ Jesus. Now you'll notice where that's at in the chapter, right? It's near toward the very end. I'm going to start with him at the very beginning. So we open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and I just started reading, and I said, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that was as far as I got. Now, my voice ends as though I still have more to say, but I just said that much, and Stephen's looking down at his Bible, and he goes, well, that's it. (laughs) And I stopped, and I said, I said, what's it? Help me out here. What are you thinking? And he goes, well, I, I can't argue with that. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It was by God's will and not Paul's. And I'm sitting there, and in my mind, I'm thinking, it can't be this easy. (laughs) I really was expecting a long, drawn-out argument that we were going to have here, and I I said, okay, well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you see that, but let's go through this further. And as we continued all the way through 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he was just sitting there going, yep, yep, it's by God's will and not ours. 
the power of God's Word to change the heart and the mind. Not by our will, not by our best arguments, not by however we think we can dress it up to make it the most appealing to the most number of people. It is the power of God's Word in the heart of a person that transforms them from foolishness to wisdom, from a darkened mind to an enlightened mind. And this not of ourselves, this not of our boasting, for as we read at the very conclusion of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let he who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now as we look at the structure of this passage that we're reading today, verses 18 through 31, if you just kind of set your eyes on it, you probably notice some things right away. This first statement is where I'll probably end up spending the most of my time this morning. On verse 18, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that statement sits over the rest of what we read here in chapter 1. It is in light of that statement that we come to knowledge of God, that we come to salvation, and as we read about in verse 30, it's righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We are grown in an understanding of these things. We grow in holiness. We grow in uh, an understanding of our own redemption. All that came to our minds and our understanding regarding our own salvation. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I didn't know everything in the Bible. And there's things that we come to grow in knowledge of as we walk with the Lord day by day according to his word. And so that verse kind of sits on top of everything else that we read about here, the importance of the word of the cross. And then it's through that that we see Paul talking about God thwarting the wisdom of the wise or the wisdom of this world, the cleverness of the clever, I will set aside or I will destroy in some translations. You have these rhetorical questions. Where is the wise man? Where is the debater of this age? And Paul will make these statements that he'll resolve with a sort of a, uh, a salvation clause, if you will. Notice in verse 21, that it was through the foolishness of the message preached that God saved those who believe. In the next portion, he talks about the Jews and the Greeks. Jews uh, seek signs, Greeks search for wisdom. But it's from both the Jews and the Greeks that Christ has saved those unto himself. Verse 24. Then in verses 25 to 31, we have a second section there. And we have these three statements of God having chosen. God has chosen the foolish things of the world. God has chosen the weak things and the base things of the world. And we also have these three statements of there being not many. Look at verse 26. Consider your calling, brothers, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble. So those three are resolved with the three of God having chosen. And then we finish up in verses 30 and 31, once again recognizing that it is Christ who saves, not by the wisdom of man, so that we would boast in the Lord and not of ourselves. So there's kind of the overview, the structure of this section, and again divided into two parts, verses 18 through 25, and then verses 26 to 31. So let's come back to that first part once again, where Paul says in verse 18, the word of the cross is foolishness to the perishing. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's by the providence of God this morning that I was on social media and I saw somebody making a comment about how silly it is that Christians wear crosses around their necks. And they, uh, I'm not going to use the illustration because it's kind of crude, so I won't, I won't tell you what their parallel was, but it was essentially like, let's say there was some sort of mass shooting and everybody in commemoration of that mass shooting was wearing AR-15s around their neck. They were like, that's the equivalent of Christians wearing crosses around their neck. And when I saw that, uh, somebody was making fun of the fact that a Christian would wear a cross or honor that symbol. What came to mind was what I've been studying this week, is that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who just don't understand it. 
but to we who have come to know Christ and what He did for us on the cross. We rejoice in that. It's why the pulpit here has the symbol of a cross in it. It's why it's hanging over our congregation. That we remember it's through this we have come to this place. The cross, the message or the preaching of the cross is what brought us from sin to righteousness. What brought us from a state of perishing, of going to hell, that was our direction. And we've changed direction and we're now heading in the direction of Christ. And it was the message of the cross that got us turned around. Now there are those who hear this word and it never makes sense to them and they never turn from their sin to the understanding of Christ. They will just continue in their ignorance and foolishness ultimately to their own destruction. How is it that some hear this word and they hear power in it and others hear this word and they hear foolishness? I've heard Richard Dawkins talk about that. As a matter of fact, Richard Dawkins, who happens to be coming out with another book, I can tell you it's full of the same atheist arguments that he's been parroting for decades. But anyway, uh, Richard Dawkins once said, you know, you should make it a part of your summer reading list to read the Bible. You might think to yourself, wow, an atheist recommending to people that they read the Bible. Why would an atheist do that? Here was his reason. He said, if you read the Bible, it will make you a better atheist because you will come to find just how silly and ridiculous it all is when you actually read it. So how is it when Richard Dawkins reads the Bible that he sees foolishness? But when you and I read the Scriptures, we see the power of God. It is because of the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit in our heart. It is not because one day you just decided, you know what, I think I'm going to believe the Bible instead. <laughs> and you just conjure up in your mind this desire to read and understand the Bible. One day there was not belief, and then the next day you just decided, I'm going to believe. Now that is not to diminish or take away from the human responsibility that we all have to hear what we are being told and to repent and obey it. Whenever we find in the scriptures one place that tells us to repent, we need to listen to that and we need to follow it. As Charles Spurgeon said, if I find one place in the Bible that talks about man's responsibility to listen and obey, then that part of the Bible is true. And if I find another part of the Bible where it says that God has sovereignly chosen and ordained all things, that part of the Bible is true. And it is only man's folly that finds any contradiction between those two ideas. Sometimes we will even find those ideas side by side in the Scriptures. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Which is it? Work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, or it's God who works in me for his good pleasure? Both. The answer is both. We do have a human responsibility to hear the word and obey it. And on that day when those who did not understand the word of God stand before him in judgment, they will not be able to say, well, it was your fault that I didn't believe it, that I didn't understand it. That problem is addressed in Romans 9. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is made say to its maker, why have you made me like this? Adam tried that, incidentally. I don't know if you have ever noticed this about Adam's response to God, but once God had caught them having eaten from the tree that they were told not to eat from, he said to Adam, have you eaten of that tree? And Adam's response to him was what? The woman you put here to be with me gave me of the tree and I ate it. He was pointing the finger right back at God. Trying to say it was your fault this happened. And we've seen that same kind of error perpetuated in the seed of Adam ever since, have we not? 
people who are trying to blame God for their situation or their circumstances. Even when you see in this present age the arguments that are going on regarding social justice or critical race theory and intersectionality and some of those things, what you hear are a lot of people complaining about their circumstances. It's not fair that I have this while that guy has that. It's a whole lot of coveting and greed and envy. And the people will complain about their situation as though to point the finger back at God and say, it's your fault I'm in this position. So we need socialism to divvy stuff around and make it fair for everybody. My friends, God is going to call us from all different kinds of walks of life, all different kinds of circumstances and backgrounds, and it is still upon each and every person to listen to that call and respond and obey it. And when we stand before God in judgment, we don't answer for anyone else's sins but our own. Were our sins paid for by Christ on the cross and by faith in him, his righteousness was transferred to us? Or did we hear that message and reject it and now we have to stand before God on our own merit and not on the merit of Christ? Every single human being is going to have to stand before God and it is the word of the cross that has brought us into fellowship with God. Therefore, we recognize and we understand its power to save. But to those who don't believe, it remains foolishness. And this was, of course, the case during the time of, uh, of the first century when Paul was writing this to the Corinthians. You have the comparison between the Jews and the Greeks going on here as well. So you have the, the Greeks, right before Paul came to Corinth in Acts chapter 18, he had come from Athens. He had preached at the Areopagus there in Athens. Very famous sermon, sometimes we call it the sermon that Paul delivered on Mars Hill. And it was there that he said that God uh, has overlooked the times of ignorance, but now he calls all people everywhere to repent, for he has fixed a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness, and he has shown by whom he will judge the world by raising him from the dead. And as soon as Paul said that, how did many of those Greeks respond? Oh, the resurrection of the dead, that sounds ridiculous. And they all kind of turned away from what he was saying, though there were a few of them there that said, we want to listen to you more about this. And to them, that message became the power of God, but foolishness to the rest of the Greeks that were there. You're talking about a man who became a, 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 sorry, let me back up here, almost went Mormon all of a sudden, a man who became God. That, was, that would have been totally backwards. You're talking about God who became man. He put on flesh and dwelt among us, and he let the very creatures that he created put him to death on a cross, hanging naked on a thief's cross for a crime that he did not do. And that is your salvation? Amen, my brethren. I had a conversation with a man one time I was witnessing to in a park, and he said, oh, I know all about what you Christians believe. You mean to tell me that you believe that one day your God, who looks like a man, is going to come back riding on a white horse to receive his own in his, in his heavenly kingdom forever? And I said, yes, amen. Amen to that. That's right there in Revelation 19. So things like this it sound ridiculous to people. Uh, it, never, it never ceases to uh, make me chuckle when somebody brings up, oh, will you believe this Bible where serpents talk and donkeys talk and all these ridiculous things that happen in the Old Testament that never, it could not have happened at all. Uh, and, and to such a person who's most likely a Darwinist, I'll say, well, you believe in talking animals. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, you believe we're just evolved apes. We're just talking animals is all we are. You believe a squirrel can become an elephant. A rock can become life. Nothing can become something. And you're telling me that I'm absurd? For we know where all of these things came from. They come from God. And if we can read Genesis 1-1 and believe it, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and there's nothing else in the Bible that we cannot believe. If he can bring something from nothing, then he can do everything including save a people for himself through the foolishness of the cross. This instrument of death in the Roman Empire, it was, 
excruciating pain. And that's literally where the word comes from. Excruciating means out of the cross. They had to invent a new word to describe the kind of pain that a person went through on the cross when they died. Jesus was hung between two thieves, though he was the one who was innocent. And he went through that pain, shedding his blood, ultimately meaning that he gave his life for ours. The worst part of that cross, the worst part of that cross, specifically Christ's cross, not the thieves on either side, but the cross that Jesus was dying on. The worst part about it is not all of the physiological things that you will sometimes hear people describe about the pain of the cross. Indeed, those things are surely humbling to consider because you think about God himself stepping off of his throne, putting on flesh and dwelling among us, living basically the life of a homeless man and yet charitably gave of of himself to people, lived a perfect life, did not sin at all, and yet died the death that we were supposed to die in our place. Those things are very humbling for us to consider. But the worst thing about the cross is not all of the different physical things that he went through as he was hanging there. The worst part about the cross is that Jesus Christ took the wrath of God upon himself for us. That was the worst part. Why does it record Jesus being the one crying out, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani? And not the things that the thieves were crying out next to him. Because Jesus is calling out to his Father who is pouring his wrath out on him so that he would not have to pour his wrath out on us. And Christ taking the wrath of God upon himself with his death there on the cross adds all the more to our understanding of the power of the cross for our salvation. It is said in the Psalms that God has a cup full of foaming wine and he will pour out onto the wicked, draining it down to the dregs. And after Christ drank that cup for us, what were his final words? It is finished. The work of atonement was completed and by the power of of Christ on the cross, we have forgiveness. God demonstrated that he received that sacrifice from his son by raising him from the dead. And so now we have not only the forgiveness of sins, but even the promise of eternal life. As our brother shared this morning, if the message of resurrection, which comes up in 1 Corinthians 15, if that's not true, then we are of all men the most to be pitied. Our faith is futile, and it means nothing, and we are still dead in our sins, Paul says. Isn't it fascinating that the book of 1 Corinthians is bookended by the statement of the power of the cross and a statement of the power of his resurrection? And all of the things that Paul has to address in between still come back to these two things. Paul is addressing a church that is really divided. And why are they divided? They're divided because they're following after the knowledge of men. They're following after desires within their own flesh. They're infants in the faith, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, instead of being mature believers in God. So he has to come back to helping them understand once again, our salvation is not in our own doing. It is not in our own wisdom. It is not in the most convincing arguments of man but it is by the power of God. Consider what the Geneva Bible says. The Geneva Study Bible on 1 Corinthians 1.18 states, it is that in which he declares his marvelous power in saving his elect, which would not so evidently appear as if it depended upon any help of man. For if it did, man might attribute that to himself, which is to be attributed only to the cross of Christ. John 3.36 says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This church that is struggling with understanding even basic precepts of the gospel 
that is divided because they are interacting with one another according to their flesh and not according to the Spirit. Paul wants them to be unified and that there would be no divisions among them, he says to them. But to bring about this unity, it happens only by the cross. The message of the cross brings salvation and union, and any other message apart from the cross brings destruction and division. So consider how Paul will interact with those things as we continue on. Look at your text again as we go down to verse 19. Paul says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. There are two Old Testament references here in this particular section. The first one is at the beginning here in verse 19. And where did we have our last one? At the very conclusion in verse 31, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So consider those two statements together, both of which are from Isaiah. Put them together and think of them as like one complete thought. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And it's almost like in between preaching from Isaiah, Paul expounds on those thoughts with uh, everything else that we have here in this particular text. What does it mean that God would destroy the wisdom of the wise? Here is that text from Isaiah 29, 14, which says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Through the cross, God has made the foolish things of men into the great work of his sovereign plan of redemption. I'm sure that when the Romans devised crucifixion, they had no idea that it was by the providential hand of God that they even came up with this idea, and that God was going to use that instrument of death to be the salvation of all who would believe in Jesus, of all who would look upon the cross and be saved. And so Paul goes on in verse 20 to say, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You don't have to go very far to find people in this world spouting off their wisdom that they think you need in order to live, in order to survive, in order to unlock all the secrets of the universe or whatever their reasoning might happen to be. Perhaps you've heard of the Large Hadron Collider, the particle uh, accelerator that was built actually on the line between France and Switzerland. It kind of crosses the border, but most of the Hadron Collider is in France. What is the purpose of the Large Hadron Collider? Well, there's different things that they're studying with this huge machine. Supersymmetry, extra dimensions. They're trying to understand dark matter, but the main purpose of putting this together was to find what they termed or what they referred to as the God Particle. The very building block of all things. How do we come to an understanding of who we are, where we came from, and what we're made of? Well, we're going to build this massive machine that spans between two countries in order to get a better idea of how physics work. You know, I could have given you the answer to that question without having to build a big machine. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's another Tower of Babel. It's another device that man has created to try to ascend to the place of God and ultimately get nowhere. Millions and millions, if not billions of dollars, have been poured out into this machine that are never in a million years going to unlock for them the secrets of the universe. They might become the most brilliant physicians that time has ever witnessed. And they will be no closer to God. Now, I love space exploration. I think it's absolutely fascinating. But as much as we think that 
the landing on the moon was a great achievement of man, it was yet another Tower of Babel. And they got further into the heavens than the Babylonians ever got building their tower, right? The Saturn V rocket got us all the way to the moon, around the moon, several times. And yet still as far away from God as they were on earth, without the gospel. Yes, there were some Christian astronauts though, that were on those missions. Uh, I fully acknowledge that. But it was the rocket itself did not get man any closer to God. It was only by the power of God's word that man can be made right with God. And isn't it fascinating to consider, my brothers and sisters, that right now, sitting where you are, you are closer to God than if you were on the moon. Join together with the Lord and with his saints to worship him on the Lord's day. Where else would you rather be? God has made foolish the wisdom of this age. And we can see all around us every day in the headlines how God is making foolish the wisdom of man. It is now popular opinion that a man can become a woman. Yes, you are right to chuckle at that. It's absurd. But this is God giving man over to his own depravity. And claiming to be wise, they became fools. As it says in Romans 1. Consider also these words from Ephesians 5, 17 to 19. Therefore, this I say to testify in the Lord, that you walk no longer as the pagans also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now once again, as I had said earlier, we all have a responsibility to hear the word of God and respond to it. And at the same time, it is God who either hardens the heart or opens it up to understanding. So in Romans 1, it says that man who did not give thanks to God, God gave them over to their own depravity. In Ephesians 5, very similar thing, but it says there, they having become callous have given themselves over to sensuality, for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Which is it? Did God give them over or did they give themselves over? Again, the answer is both. The natural state of our hearts is in rebellion against God. And if it were not for God in His mercy and grace, this would be the fate of all of us. We would all be given over to our own passions of our flesh to our own destruction. And yet these two beautiful words in the Bible, but God did not leave us to die in our sins and our transgressions, but made us alive together with Christ. Where are those in this world that can make sense of this? Paul has this wonderful salvation clause in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. We could not have come to salvation by our own efforts. Praise God that he has raised us from death to life. We continue on to the next part where Paul contrasts Jews and Greeks, verses 22 to 25. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Surely you're familiar with Matthew 12, 38 to 42, where the Pharisees come to Jesus and they demand a sign from him. Show us a sign that we may believe and we may know that you are the one who has been sent. And what was Jesus' response to them? A crooked and wicked generation asked for a sign. No sign will be given to this generation, but the sign of what? The sign of Jonah. Who, just as he was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. 
And it was this sign, his resurrection from the dead, that would be for our salvation. Those who would believe it would be saved. Those who thought it was utter foolishness would perish. Now, what's fascinating about Jesus' response to the Pharisees is he had done many signs, did he not? Had healed right there in their very presence, and yet they did not believe that the power of God was upon him. They refused to believe it. And we might think to ourselves, very proudly to ourselves, we might think, hey, I would not have been as dumb as those Pharisees. Are you sure about that? Because if it is not by God's will that your eyes be open to see, then your eyes won't be open to see. As it says in Ecclesiastes, who can turn back what God has established? Who can straighten what he's made crooked? We have come to this salvation in Christ Jesus because God was merciful. Because he was gracious. As I've heard R.C. Sproul say, you want to say that you are saved by God's grace? but you think you had something to do with it? Then what is grace? If God did not freely by His own accord save us from the direction that we were all headed to hell because of our sins and our transgressions and our rebellion against God. But God is the one who is saved, even from the Jews and the Gentiles. We preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Elsewhere to the Corinthians, Paul says that I decided to know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. So He did not come speaking to them words of eloquent wisdom, but just declaring to them the power of the cross so that it would be through this message that they would come to salvation and not by the most eloquent of words of those gifted orators that the Greeks like to listen to. And so Paul goes on here in verse 24, to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we have a salvation statement there, just like we had at the end of the previous statement. From the Jews and the Greeks, how did we come to salvation? If the Jews think the message of the cross is, is foolishness and the Greeks think it's foolishness, then how in the world did they come to faith in this anyway? by the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so ending this section in verse 25, kind of repeating verse 18 in such a way, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You take whatever idea or concept of God that you find in the Bible that you think the most ridiculous thing that you could possibly read in any other context, and that is greater than the loftiest idea that man can ever conjure up. You think it's ridiculous that a donkey could talk? Well, that's even greater than the Saturn V rocket. That God could make a donkey talk and turn a rebellious man away from the destruction that he was headed to if he had continued on the road the way that he was. Balaam we're talking about there. So there's that first section with Paul emphasizing the word of the cross, and the wisdom of God being greater than the wisdom of man. And Paul's motivation here, once again, his purpose and his desire is that this church would be unified, that they would not be divided from one another, but that there would be no divisions among them, that they would together have the mind of Christ. And so as we consider a quick application before moving on to the next, may it be the same for you, my brothers and sisters. Now, I, I say to you, a benefit that you have over the church that I pastor is you are smaller in number. There's still a possibility of cliques to form and things like that, even within small numbers. But we have a much larger church in Lindale, and I don't say that to boast. I've spent most of my life in small churches. The church that I pastored in Kansas was a lot like this size. But here in a church this size, you have even less excuse to be divided from one another than we who have greater numbers. So understand that it is the word of the cross, not by our efforts to be unified, but by the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that we are brought together as one body in Christ. Paul will talk more about that over the course of 1 Corinthians. But may this be the very thing that brings you together and bonds you to one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord, because you are united in Christ. 
Unity in Christ Jesus is not something that we manufacture, just like you didn't manufacture your own faith. You do not manufacture unity that we have in the body of Christ. It was purchased by Christ with his blood, which is why Paul says in Ephesians 4 that you maintain unity in the spirit of the bond of peace. Not that you would find some unity. It's already been given to you in Christ. Maintain it in the gospel that is preached to you. Next section goes from verses 26 to 31. And Paul starts here in verse 26 this way. Consider your calling, brothers, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not, not many who were mighty, not many who were noble. Now, I love the way that this particular section starts. Consider your calling, because it's, it's like Paul is writing to them and saying, look around you. Who is there that is sitting among you? Not many of you were wise according to the flesh. Not many were mighty, not many were noble. See, we have these three not many statements which are going to be counteracted by these uh, God has chosen statements, the three God has chosen statements that are coming up. But for Paul to say not many are wise, that's not to say that none are wise. Like there were some that were sitting among them in the church in Corinth that even by man's standard, they were considered to be really wise. There were people, as we understand, that were even from uh, like, the, like the town council, we might consider it that way, in Corinth, that had become part of the Corinthian church. When you read about the background to the Corinthian church in Acts chapter 18, the first leader of the synagogue became a Christian and joined Paul's church. And then because he was the leader of the synagogue, he got replaced by another guy, and that guy became a member of Paul's church. Two consecutive leaders of the synagogue came to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. So there were people who were considered wise by the world's standard, but then there were many that were not. Not many that were wise, according to the flesh. Not many were mighty. There may have been some among them who were even Roman or Greek soldiers and had become members of this church in Corinth. He says, not many were noble, or in some of your translations, not many were of noble birth, but there perhaps were those who were in ruling positions that had become members of the church in Corinth. As Paul instructed the church in 1 Timothy 2 to pray for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly in every way. God desires even for kings and for those who are in high positions to be saved. So let me ask you, did you pray for your president today? I'm just going to leave it at that. We continue on. As Paul's saying, not many were my, mighty according to the flesh, not many were noble, not many were wise. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame those things which are strong. Now before getting to this third God has chosen, consider this. If you don't like the doctrine of election, that God has chosen those whom he, mean to, he means to save. And he foreordained this from before the foundation of the world. If you don't like that doctrine, then God didn't choose you. He got stuck with you. The most foolish among you, God just got stuck with you. He didn't actually choose you. That's not very wonderful to think about. That doesn't really demonstrate God's love when we think about it that way. That God hasn't chosen. Things just by chance happen to work out this way. Is that what we want to subject God to? That his body and his family that he is father over are just a family that he happened into by chance? Now, I have five wonderful children one of whom is adopted, one of whom I chose. The other four, I want to clarify, I did not get stuck with. <laughs> they were by God's providence that he gave me these beautiful children that I love. Whether the one who is adopted or the four who are my biological children, they are all the Lord's. And he has entrusted them to me for their care. 
And I hope to one day be able to stand before the Lord and he say to me on the matter of fatherhood, well done, good and faithful servant. And praise God that he can work with my children through my faults and my weaknesses because there are plenty of ways as a father that I fall far short. But ultimately the salvation of my children is not in my hands. It is in God's hands. God has chosen the weak things, the foolish things. The final God-chosen statement is in verse 29. The base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not. I understand in our common uh, modern lingo, the word based now has come to mean something like awesome. It's, it's like uh, what awesome was in the 80s is now based in the 2020s. Uh, but in this particular case, in this usage of the word, it means the lowest of the low, the, the least considered, the base things of the world, the despised. This is what God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may abolish the things that are. Ultimately, verse 29, so that no flesh may boast before God. It is not in us that we can boast for our salvation. It is boasting in God alone. As a pastor, I have been delighted to see people at their absolute lowest come to salvation in Jesus Christ. I have had the privilege of baptizing a man who just weeks before had a gun in his mouth and was millimeters from pulling the trigger and ending his own life. But God had mercy on him. And he turned from his sin to a knowledge of God through the gospel that was declared to him. And he was baptized, testifying before the church that he had been buried with Christ in his sins and risen again to new life. I mentioned Mormonism a moment ago. I've had the privilege of seeing a person who was a Mormon who grew up in that religion, understanding that doctrine and believing in a different Christ, come to realize that the Christ that he had been talked about was the wrong Christ all along, and the true Christ was proclaimed in this word, not the Book of Mormon or Pearl of Great Price or Doctrine and Covenants. And through the declaration of this word, his heart was transformed to see the real Jesus. And it was my privilege to see him baptized so that no flesh may boast before God. It was not my doing. It was even, not even their doing. Changing their minds from one foolish idea to a better idea. All of this is by the power and the providence of God. So that no flesh may boast before the Lord. And verse 30 just kind of summarizes the whole idea. It's by His doing. You are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. By His doing. And He became to us the wisdom from God. As Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The greatest knowledge that you could ever know is right here in the Bible. And you show me the single stay-at-home mom who's struggling to make ends meet. Maybe she works a couple of jobs on the side, doing her best to take care of her kids. You show me that woman who understands the Bible and she knows that through the gospel her sins are forgiven and she has eternal life with God. I tell you, she is smarter than any of those men who built that Hadron Collider. This is the wisdom of God. That we may know Christ and Him crucified for our sins. And righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Our ability even to do what is right comes from God. Our growing in this, our being made holy comes from God. Our redemption, being rescued out of this world and guaranteed an eternal inheritance with Him and His forever kingdom. This is all by the power of God. So that just as it is written, let Him who boasts, 
boast in the Lord. I came out of a background, and some of you, many of you probably have or have had this experience at some point in your life. I came out of a background that was mostly churches that were devoted to dressing up the gospel a certain way to be the most convincing to the most number of people. We call them seeker-sensitive churches. Or in some circles, the purpose-driven movement. Where we try to make the Bible palatable. We try to appeal to the flesh is essentially what's being done there. We want to get the most number of people through those doors. And hey, as long as they're in here with us, they're not out there causing a lot of trouble, right? But as I've heard Paul Washer say, what you win them with is what you win them to. If you appeal to their flesh to get them in the doors, you're going to have to continue appealing to their flesh to keep them there. Because it's not by their spirits they have been transformed. It's not in the Holy Spirit of God. It's, it's simply in the delights of the flesh. Our ability to dress up the gospel is never going to bring a person to Christ. As a matter of fact, what it does is it hides the gospel and it drives people further away. The numbers that we see, if we should ever boast in the number of baptisms that we have or the number of conversions or the number of people that have made a decision for Christ, the number of people we send out on the mission field, whatever numbers we are able to boast in, it has never been by our persuasion that these numbers have been so blessed to escalate. It's because God has blessed. We have the responsibility to preach the gospel God is the one who turns the person around and brings them to him. As I've heard Vody Bauckham say, I'm just in communications. My daddy's the one who seals the deal. <laughs> so that as it is written, let him who boasts. We boast not in ourselves. We boast in the Lord. You know, one of the things I, one of the things I love about that statement is Paul acknowledging from Isaiah that boasting is good. It is okay to boast. As long as your boasting is not in yourself. It is not in the person that brought you here. It's not in the greatest speaker that, uh, you know, my speaker is better than your speaker. The Corinthians were having that problem, right? Read that earlier in chapter 1. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. It's not in any of this. It's in Christ. Boast in the Lord. Go from this place and tell people, I am happy to be a follower of Jesus Christ who saved me and gave himself for me. Let me give you some applications as we close here. Let me me leave you with three. Why is this relevant? What is this good for for us? To know that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is the relevance in all of this? Well, number one for us, it it is for our comfort. You can be comforted in knowing that it's not by your doing. It is the work of God. Lest we run ourselves ragged thinking we have to do something to save ourselves or we have to do something to keep ourselves in the favor of God. It's not our doing. It's God's work in us. And this is for our comfort. That we would delight in Him. That we would have an understanding of the assurance of our salvation. Isn't it so wonderful to dwell in assurance than to rather constantly have to be asking, how do I know if I'm really saved? My friends, if you're trying to maintain your own salvation, you'll find yourself constantly asking that question. Have I done enough yet to be sure of my salvation? As I've heard Alistair Begg say, sin and assurance cannot dwell in the same house together. So you can either have your sin, you can have the desires of your flesh, you can go after the temptations of this world and the enticements of Satan and then never really have assurance of salvation. You will constantly be wondering, when am I going to perish under the judgment of God? When am I going to get what I deserve? And you'll live in fear. You won't live in assurance. 
But if you turn from that sin to the Lord Jesus Christ and you hold fast to him and you cling to him and you look to the cross, you have assurance of your salvation. Certain, not because of any work that you've done, but because of the finished work that Christ has done. The whole reason John wrote his first epistle, 1 John, was so that you would have assurance of salvation. He says in chapter 5, I have written these things to you so that you may know that you are saved. So my friends, if you struggle with that now, if wondering if you are saved or not, and what God demands and requires of me as his follower, now that I've come to believe in the power of the cross, read 1 John. Go home and read it today, all five chapters. Pour over that. Let it pour into your hearts that you may be comforted in the work that God has done for you. So that's first application. This is for our comfort. Second application, this is for our joy. We rejoice in this. Do you delight to come to church on a Sunday morning and hear the word of God proclaimed and, he, and sing his praises and fellowship with one another and talk about these things? I remember uh, uh, having a young man come to me in church, um, uh, a very new believer, and he came out of the Pentecostal movement, a very uh, a rabidly Pentecostal. Uh, you know, and I mean that almost literally, the whole flopping on the floor and foaming on the mouth thing. That's what he was doing. And then just weeks later comes to recognize that all of that is just for show. Wasn't even, none of it was actually real. And he came to understand the power of God through the word and not through an experience. And so as he was a new believer in our church, I baptized he and his wife. And he came up to me after church. I don't remember if it was the same day I baptized him or if it was the week after. But he said to me, you know, I'd love to get together and just talk theology with you. But I just, I feel like you've been doing that all week and then you preach all Sunday morning, you're probably done. You just don't want to talk about those things anymore. And I said to him, brother, there is nothing I would rather talk about than the good things God has done for me through the cross. And there's so much of this word I don't get yet. Believe it or not, your pastor doesn't know everything. I don't know, Pastor Jason might. But you know, speaking, speaking for myself, I certainly don't. So we never come to the end of this. We keep studying, we keep growing in that righteousness and sanctification and redemption that was talked about there. And this for our joy, our delight, that we would worship God. The message of the cross is a joy to us. We will never get tired of it. We want to talk about it all the time. You know, the wonderful thing about this cross, even with the way that we display it in our Protestant churches, you notice anything on that cross? No, there's nothing on it, is there? Unlike the Greek Orthodox Church or the Roman Catholic Church where what's on there? Jesus is still hanging there. He never came down 2,000 years later. But it's a deliberate Protestant symbol that the cross is empty because we know he was buried and he's risen again. This cross is the pivotal point of all human and cosmic history. Everything revolves around the cross. The Old Testament looks forward to it. The New Testament looks back at it. Jesus Christ, who died for sins, who rose again from the dead, who ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God, and he's coming back again to judge the living and the dead. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Is that your joy? And when we think about that being our joy, when you get grumpy today, look at the cross. Consider what Christ went through for you. That you would realize these things that frustrate us in our day to day are nothing. Paul says even the worst things that we go through, I can't even compare to the glory that awaits us if we endure to the end. In second. Corinthians 1.9, this really goes back with my previous point for our comfort, but he says uh, that we had gone through something that for us, we thought we had received the sentence of death, but this was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. This is for our comfort, it is for our joy. And even the worst of experiences meant to bring us all the more closer to Christ. 
Third application. This is for our understanding. So it's for our comfort. It's for our joy. It is for our understanding. Because we see the power of the cross through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Those who are perishing don't get it. They think it's foolishness. So the message of the cross is for our understanding. And one of the other things that we understand by this, my friends, is recognizing there are many people in this world who are perishing. They are going to hell right now. Some of them trying to get there so fast they're out there with their picks and shovels, digging holes right in the middle of the road, trying to get to hell. Not saying literally, but you can just see it in their actions, in their lifestyle, trying to get there faster. Uh, I wrote a blog not long ago about Freddie Mercury, who was the lead singer of the band Queen. He died at the age of 44. Through his, his living for his flesh, his living for the world. He was a homosexual. He did lots of drugs. He died very young. And you see that happening with a lot of people in the world. Living for their own passions of their flesh, they die young and they die fast. And we recognize that that's going on in the world, but we were in that same place, if not for the gospel that turned us from that to life that we have in Jesus Christ. So we must understand the urgency to share the gospel with the world and recognize in that mission that we've been called to, God has intended that the church is going to be his messenger to the world to share the word of the cross. But we understand that when the world dismisses it as foolishness, that just means the Bible's right. Because the Bible says that's going to happen. But when a person turns from their sin to the knowledge of Christ and belief and faith in the gospel, that's by the power of God. It was not because, hey, I had a really convincing day today. No, the Holy Spirit did His power. You were an instrument. Praise God that He chose to use you to bring about the salvation of His elect. He was going to use you to speak that message to someone God had already chosen from, the, from before the foundation of the world to bring to himself. And the message of that cross became power to the one who believed. As it says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And it goes on to say in verse 17 that the just shall live by faith. So we come to understand, we come to know these things by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through what? The Word of Christ. This is how we came to know and believe. This is how we have been saved, because the Word was preached to us, and we believed it by the power of God. So once again, our applications, we read this, and we come to understand this for our comfort, we understand this for our joy, and may that joy bring unity within the body as well. And lastly, for our understanding, that we may look upon the cross and we see the power of God and the work of redemption that He is doing from beginning to end. We may not see the full picture and understand it clearly on this side of heaven, but my friends, I promise you, because the Bible says so, not because Gabe says so, we will stand before him and we will see him face to face and then we will know just as we are fully known. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful word that we have read today. Hearing about the awesomeness and the wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this becomes to us in the hearts of your believers more than a religious symbol. We've often thought about this or wondered about this or maybe we don't give it much thought at all. But now having read today about the power of this message, Christ who died on the cross for our sins, who rose again from the dead, whether or not we were aware of it when we came to salvation, it was this message that brought us there. This was the work that you had predestined before the foundation of the world. That we would hear the word of the cross. And that now in light of having heard that message and believed it, we would walk in holiness before you all the rest of our days 
until we appear with Christ in glory. We can look around us and we see a world that is going to hell. God, give us boldness and courage to declare the gospel to those who are perishing. We know there are going to be those, the vast majority of them, who will mock us and will not believe because your word says so. But we are also told that there are others that you have ordained would come to faith. So may we, trusting in your word, preach the word. Not trying to dress it up, not trying to change it or make it more palatable to a world that is perishing, but we simply preach the same gospel that was spoken to us so that our boasting would not be in ourselves, but all the praise and glory belongs to God above. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.